This, of course, is uh, what's known as Passion Week. It's kicked off today on Palm Sunday. If you didn't know today was Palm Sunday, you slept through the worship service, right? Because it was all hosannas and palm, which is great. And from today through Good Friday and the resurrection next Sunday, this is probably the best week for Christians that there is as we turn our hearts and minds that way and start focusing on the things that matter. We're, we're all familiar with the triumphal entry, and uh, as was read at the beginning and middle of the service. It's a story that's relayed in all four Gospels, and it's a good exercise to go through. I love to do that when, when they're all in the four Gospels and go through and read it and to see the different angles and, and what the guys were emphasizing. We know that from John's Gospel, Jesus had just raised Lazarus from the dead, and there was a buzz everywhere. And you can imagine people running and shouting and running on into Jerusalem, telling people, you're not going to believe what just happened, four days and all that. We know that Jesus sends the two disciples off to get the, the donkey, and he begins his slow ride into the city. We know he stops and weeps over Jerusalem, and he's crying over the hardness of heart and how they always reject the word of the Lord and kill the prophets. We know that there are people shouting and screaming and cutting branches off of trees and laying cloaks in the road and, and uh, saying, Hosanna. We know that there's probably just as big a group pouring out of the city, as Greg read about you know, the people say, what's the buzz all about? Jerusalem is all excited. And they said, it's the prophet Jesus. Oh, good, the prophet Jesus. Let's go see Jesus. And so, you know, they had this mass of humanity that's circling around Jesus as he's riding in. We know that all the stories that go around with this, this isn't a new story to any of us, probably, if, if you've read through the Bible, if you've been in church any time in your life. We know that the religious rulers are upset because of all the buzz that's going on around Jesus. So much so that as the children are yelling, Hosanna, they say, will you tell those kids to be quiet? And Jesus said, if I do, the stones are going to cry out. You know, it's going to get out that he is the Messiah. And with a little bit of imagination, maybe some of us have pictured ourselves in the crowd, right? Maybe you've done that at some time. No, no, we're not jumping, screaming people. Maybe we're over on the side and we got a little branch. And we're... <laughs> Hosanna. <laughs> yeah. We're not really jumpers and screamers around here, but we know what's taken place. We've seen the pictures and we understand it. We know that this was the beginning of the last week of Jesus' life. We know that it's the Passover and the city is packed. And we know that the priests are examining lambs over in one part of town as the Lamb of God is coming into town. And we know he's going to teach all week in the temple and they're going to be looking for imperfections in him and they're not going to find anything because he's the perfect, spotless Lamb of God. Amen. And he's going to be the sacrifice that finally does what no earthly lamb could do, which is to take the blood and apply it in the real mercy seat in heaven. And sin will finally be dealt with instead of covered over. And we rejoice in that because it is phenomenal news. We rejoice in it. It's all good to look at and it's all wonderful, but today I want to look at a fig tree. <laughs> and in Mark 11, if you want to turn there with me, I want to read a couple of sections of Scripture. Mark 11, the first sections, 12 through 14. And on the following day when they came from Bethany, he was hungry, he being Jesus. And seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And the disciples heard it. So they go on into Jerusalem, and they come out, and you drop down to verse 20. It says, As they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. And Peter remembered and said to them, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered them, Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says, it will come to pass. It will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. Both Matthew and Mark tell this story, and we read it. It's around when Jesus is coming into the city and coming out of the city. But I've never really stopped that much and thought about Mark's take on it and what he uh, enlightens in this. Lots of preachers use this passage to heap guilt on people for their lack of faith. You know, someone's going to the hospital and, and some 
probably good-hearted folks say to them, if you just had more faith, this wouldn't be going on. Bless their little pointed head, that doesn't help. It often causes a lot more pain and anguish because of misapplying of a passage. Some other guys, name it and claim it guys, use this passage to confess for Cadillacs and airplanes and financial abundance and wealth that if you just ask whatever you want, God will give it to you, so therefore I'm asking for a new jet because I need a new jet. Some guy right now is wanting $18 billion or whatever it is to buy a new jet, probably using this verse, I don't know, but I've heard guys do this. Now, one thing about Mark is that he's got a little different style than the other Gospels. If you're even remotely familiar with Mark, it always seems like he's in a hurry. He just writes that way. If you're required to take Greek in seminary, they almost always have you translate Mark because it's shorter and the English is easier or the words are easier and it's quick. So Mark always says immediately. Matter of fact, 35 times he says it in the scripture. It's like Jesus is immediately doing this and then he immediately went there and he immediately did this. And it's like Mark says, I don't have a whole lot of time to waste with stuff. We're going to get right to the point. So in some ways, he's pretty good for our generation. He would be the first disciple using texting and all that, I would imagine. Uh, <clears throat> instant everything. So here's a point I want to get to today is that we often stop reading at verse 24, but verse 25 is connected to this in the Gospel of Mark, and it's interesting to me. As he's talking about confessing and asking what you want, he says, Whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. It's almost as if Mark is saying, look, there's no time to waste. Let's get to the heart of the Passion Week, and that is forgiveness. <laughs> Let's get to it. Jesus is coming into town. He's going to be sacrificed. And the point is, is that he's going to save people through his death through the power of forgiveness. And he adds this in here. And I'm going, huh, that's interesting. Brutal men are going to kill him, and he's going to forgive them. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. <laughs> The cross is all about forgiveness. The Son came to seek and save those who needed to be saved, which is all of us. The Lamb of God came to give His life, and it's going to come through the cross, and it's going to come in the, with forgiveness. And Mark <clears throat> says, when you're praying, forgive. <laughs> and it all ties together in my mind, and maybe that scares some of you, but it does. The Lamb of God came to set us free. He came to remove the bonds of slavery. And many times that slavery is wrapped around forgiveness and unforgiveness. Jesus came to take us out of the kingdom of darkness and bring us into the kingdom of light. One of them is dominated with bitterness and unforgiveness and sin. And one of them is full forgiveness, freedom and light in Christ. No longer slave or bound to anything. It's interesting what he says. He says, if... You're standing there praying, and if you have anything against anyone, now, what does that cover? I mean, I, I like to break things down in my mind so I can understand it. Anything and anyone, is there something outside of that that maybe I'm missing? I know we're not doing a Greek lesson, but anything against anyone, and I go, Wow. Every one of us has been or will be hurt, insulted, offended, slighted, neglected, overlooked, unloved, spoken against, assigned wrong motives, falsely accused, wounded, treated badly, fill in the blank. Is there something I forgot there? You didn't do that one. Okay, add it to it. All of us, this is going to happen to us as we walk through this life. We're going to be hurt. We're going to be wounded. We're going to be offended. We're going to be overlooked. We're going to be slighted. We're going to be left out. We're, people are going to assign us wrong motives. We do our best to do something. They say, you did that because you're wicked. They go, really? I was trying to do good. And you get slammed for it. Who is there that doesn't need to extend forgiveness to someone else? Anybody? <laughs> if you're married... I guarantee you that you have multiple opportunities on a regular basis to extend forgiveness one to another. Do you not? Wounds happen. Neglect happens. Selfishness happens. Sin happens. Is the heart of the gospel about forgiveness? 
should we make the application in our own life? <laughs> we are to extend forgiveness. If you have children, or you are a child, how many of you in here are a child? <laughs> Everybody is. I mean, none of you were created in a test tube, I think, or, or whatever. <laughs> we all have parents, and parents fail. Most of us in here have brothers and sisters. They fail. They hurt. They're mean. They wound. They mock. They laugh. They look down on. You don't measure up to. Why can't you be like so-and-so? And why they do it well and you don't? They're wonderful and you're a louse. You know, you hear the enemy saying these things to you. There's opportunities for forgiveness in the family is the point. If you work somewhere, I guarantee you that you're going to have a boss who is imperfect. They're going to be rude sometimes. They're going to be caring about their deadlines and not yours. They're going to be harsh to you. They're going to neglect you. They're not going to pay you what you're worth. They're going to say something's going to happen. God's going to make sure of it so that we get to move into the point of the gospel of forgiveness. One point anyway. Church people, students, everybody has this. And Mark really doesn't have a whole lot of time to develop it because he's such in a hurry about everything. He says, when you're standing there praying, if you have anything against anybody, that pretty well covers it, forget. And by the way, he throws this in, so that, don't you love that? Could have left that out. When you're standing there praying and you have anything against anybody, forgive them. So that your Father also, who is in heaven, may forgive your trespasses. Really? You're going to put that in there, Lord? How about a break? You don't understand what this person has done to me. Jesus said, really? They were crucifying me. <laughs> Perfect one. Betrayed. Lied about. Betrayed by one of my own. In the worst possible way, he comes up and kisses me. I washed his feet, and he betrayed me. <laughs> wow. Wow. These guys are gambling for my clothes as I'm dying. And I said, forgive them. Wow. Seems to be a connection between giving and receiving forgiveness. <laughs> Isn't there? I think the scripture says that. Now, a friend once asked me the difference between forgiveness and restoration. I can freely forgive because I've been freely forgiven by God. The restoration is a process. It's a little different, and definitions matter. If you look up forgiveness, forgive, it's to stop feeling anger towards someone who has done wrong. That's pretty good. I need to get to the place where when somebody has wronged me, I get past that anger towards them. I like that. To stop blaming someone. You know, our culture, everybody's a victim. I'm a victim. They did this to me, therefore this. You know, at some point in time, we've got to move past that and say, this thing happened, and it's time to move on. God's in charge. Stop requiring payment. Usually they're talking about money like forgive a debt, but I wonder if we cannot apply that to wounds and offenses. As we relive these things in our mind where we were done wrong, that we could stop demanding payment for it. Yeah, we take a snapshot of it. We have it frozen in our brain, and every once in a while we pull it out and relive the whole thing. I can't believe they did that to me. Just start beating the picture. How dare they do that to me? And we relive it all and we get all emotional again and upset about it. Is that just me or is you guys all looking pretty pious out there? You know, it's a temptation I struggle with. Stop requiring payment. It happened. And it's time to move on. I mean, meet people that are in their 50s, 60s, 70s that are still bound up by what happened in junior high school. It's time to move on. I'm not denying the pain, but it's time to quit letting it ruin your life. It's time to forgive and move on. Now, restoration is a different animal. You look that up and it says the act of process of returning something to its original condition. The act of bringing back something that existed before. We are restoring. I forgive in an instant. Restoration may or may not even be possible. Restoration starts with a decision, if it is possible, and it should be our goal. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch to yourself, lest you too be tempted. <laughs> restoration should be a goal, and it starts with forgiveness, but sometimes restoration to bring back to the original condition is not possible. Those of you that have walked through the heartache of divorce, and, and everybody's gotten remarried, restoration to put it back the way it was is not possible. 
It's not going to happen. Some of you in here and, and some of us need to deal with people that no longer are even alive. And I'm not talking about talking to them. I'm talking about forgiving them. Some of you in here have parents that have died and it still is raw the way you were treated. And that, that hostility is there. And the anger. And you keep reliving it. And it's like, you've got to forgive them. But restoration is not possible. Not this side of heaven. It's just not going to happen. Because they're not even around anymore. But you can move to forgiveness. The case of abuse and betrayal. Major violations and damage that's been caused. The scars and wounds linger. And forgiveness can happen in an instant. But trust being restored is a process. And it may take quite a while. Depending on the depth of the wounds. There may be a great deal of time that takes place. And then you've got the whole aspect that I can forgive somebody and I can desire restoration, but if they don't, it's not possible. As far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men, the scripture says, but if the other person is not willing to reconcile or deal with it, what do we do with that? You forgive them and you hold it out and say, I'd love to whenever we can or whenever we get to that place where we can work through it. But restoration is a process. I forgive in a moment. And people say, well, is it a one-time thing? It isn't in my life. As these things revisit my brain, there's like, God, help me. Help me to live in a state of forgiveness towards people. And I pray people would do that for me, too. If we're going to enter into the Passion Week, which is where we are, perhaps we need to think about Mark's sharing of this passage. Jesus' comments about a tree, a fig tree. He goes to it expecting something and it's not there. And he curses it and it dies. How many of us are withered up in bitterness, anger, unforgiveness? How many of us have our, has the fruit stopped because we're dead on the inside? We've withered up. I know if we're bitter and unforgiving and we're like that dead fig tree I know there's another tree that we can go to that will set us free and it's the tree of Calvary we can go to the cross and find forgiveness how serious is this I mean you're talking about a fig tree on Palm Sunday how serious is it well dead fig trees are pretty serious in Matthew Jesus said here's how you pray our Father which art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done Give us our daily bread. We get to this part. Forgive us our debts. And we stop. <laughs> Don't we? I mean, in our brains, we may say the rest of the words, but do we really believe the rest of this sentence? Forgive my sins the same way I'm forgiving everybody else's sins, Lord. Wow. <laughs> Does that scare you like it scares me? I don't know. I just think, Lord, really? If you've been hurt in your life, if you've been violated, if you've been wounded, you've been damaged, that's a tough prayer. <laughs> Father, forgive me as I forgive the violator, the abuser, the persecutor, the betrayer, the neglector. The one who called me names so much as a child that I grew up with this huge mess in my life as an adult. God, forgive them as, as I do. As I, I, really? <laughs> wow. That, I don't know. I think it's serious. Matthew's take on this as well, talking about Jesus, says, For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But... If you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive yours. Ouch. <laughs> Did Jesus mean that? I, I mean, I think so. He's not really using a lot of hyperbole here, I don't think. Forgive or you're not going to be forgiven. Now, you know, how does all that work with grace? and all? You know, somebody else can explain it to you. I just know what it says, and if I've got unforgiveness in my heart, uh, Jesus wants me to deal with that. As we enter into this Passion Week, 
And it's all pointing to the cross on Friday. What was the point of the cross? Forgiveness. Forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness so we could be right with God. Forgiveness so we could extend it to everyone else. As you have been forgiven, forgive. That's what the scripture says. Going, yeah. And what if we don't? Well, you run into this passage in Hebrews, which is kind of scary to me too. See that no one fall, uh, fails to obtain the grace of God. And no root of bitterness springs up that causes trouble. And by it many become defiled. How serious is unforgiveness? It's withered tree serious. <laughs> it will destroy us. It will eat us alive. Have you been around somebody who's eaten up with bitterness? Anger? I mean, it doesn't take very long for that to come spewing out of them. How are you doing today? Well, you wouldn't believe what they did to me last week. You know, and all of a sudden it's just like, whoa. It defiles many. <laughs> and he says, see to it that you don't fall short of the grace of God. We talk about grace. Greg's talking about grace, 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 grace. We're going, I love grace. Okay, will you give grace? I don't love it that much. Let's not get carried away here now. Those people did some pretty bad things. Yeah, I'm sure they did. And so did you. <laughs> and so did I. And yet we go to God and say, God, I want your grace. He says, will you give it? Will you forgive? I, mm -hmm. <laughs> a famous saying, right? Everybody knows this. Bitterness is like drinking poison and wishing the other person dies from it. What a sentence. <laughs> we think we're hurting somebody else when we're the ones who are all bitter and upset and full of unforgiveness, and they probably don't even know it. They may not even be aware of it. And we're the ones getting consumed and withering and dying. And they're off doing their thing. <laughs> Here's some things I want us to think about, if that's not enough. Jesus is the perfect spotless Lamb of God. He was offered for forgiveness of sins. What a phenomenal price that was paid. So the question comes down to, Jesus forgave us while we were his enemies. Jesus forgave us while we hated him. Jesus forgave us when we didn't even ask for it. <laughs> Will we forgive someone else? Now I could ask for a show of hands of how many of you in here have hurt, been hurt by somebody. And how many of you have problems in this area? And I would assume that there would be at least one hand that would go up. <laughs> Almost all of us have had something like this. Will we take the message of the cross? Will we take the forgiveness that we have freely received because of what Jesus Christ did and extend it to someone else? And you can fill in the blank with the reasons why you shouldn't. You don't understand. They did this to me. Yes, but we crucified the perfect Son of God. <laughs> I'm not denying the pain or the heartache, or, or, or what happened. I'm not denying that. Those things are real, and they hurt, and the memories of them leave scars, and I understand that. And Some of you in here are struggling right now with this. But forgiveness is what Palm Sunday, Passion Week, Easter is all about. We've got to move to forgiveness. We have to. Will we forgive those who have sinned against us? Will we stop making them pay that payment? Will we quit being angry about it all the time and release them into the custody of God <laughs> to deal with it? It's a decision we make. Not once, not twice, not a hundred times sometimes, but every time. As I pray about this stuff and I go through these, these things, and he says, when you're, when you're praying. It's interesting to me that when you start praying, if you're struggling in the area of unforgiveness, how many times this comes up? It's almost as if God wants to deal with it in our lives. <laughs> and so we're praying to God. And God says, what about releasing them? You go, God, I'm not talking to you about that right now. I'm talking about this. And God said, yeah, I know, but what about that? <laughs> when you're praying and asking the Lord God I, I want to give you my full heart 
God said, I want your full heart. Now, will you let go of that piece that you've quad, you know, quadrant off over here with the tape around it that says unforgiveness? <laughs> Jail for whoever hurt you. <laughs> you've got that in your heart, my heart. God says, I want that part too. Is my blood sufficient for their sin? No, it isn't, God. Have we felt that way? Have, we, have you felt that way? Some of you in here have, I believe. Well, I've sure struggled. Yeah. I may have done some bad things, but I've never done that. And God says, really? <laughs> will we do it? Will we listen? Forgiving quickly will help prevent withering and bitterness. <laughs> Are we shriveling up? Is our relationship communication this way plugged up? Is it cloudy? God, where in the world are you? And we seek the Lord about it, and he says, you know, you, you got this thing here <laughs> that I really want you to deal with. I forgave you freely. Will you forgive them? How many stories are there in the scripture about this? How many, how many times is it dealt with in the Bible? Over and over and over again. Not just this way, but this way. Letting it go. We need to. As we move to this week and we get to the biggest day for Christians on Easter Sunday, if forgiveness isn't part of it, what in the world is? <laughs> if evidence of a resurrected life is not being able to forgive people, what is? It's my question. And restoration begins with forgiveness. Some of us are standing at a crossroads right now. And the decision you make is going to determine the direction you're going to go and where you're going to end up. And you're standing there and you've got to make a choice. <laughs> am I going to go through forgiveness and go down that path or am I going to go down the path of unforgiveness and end up in bitterness? You know what I'm talking about? It's a decision we face. Which direction are we going to go? <laughs> are we going to aim for restoration? Are we going to release people? Or are we going to continue to hold that in and end up being bitter and defile many? It's a choice you and I have to make. And I don't think it's a one-time choice. It's a direction we're going to go. I'm praying that we would be those who freely forgive as we have been forgiven freely. I don't see the Christian life working out any other way. It's got to be that way. All right, there's some things to think about. Let's, uh, let's pray. Father, I'm very grateful for forgiveness. Where would we be, Lord, if you had not forgiven us? We didn't deserve it. We were alienated. We were enemies. We were dead in our sin and violations against you. Some of us mocked and scorned and hated you, and you forgave us freely though we didn't deserve it.